Great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Malcolmson. I have the huge honor and privilege of being the principal at City Lit. And um, I would like to welcome you to our first virtual ambassador series. Um, for those of you who have been involved before, um, during our centenary in 2019, we established a whole series of different types of lectures and talks, um, highlighting the different aspects of City Lit and its great heritage. And given that we have the most extensive and comprehensive language um, school in the country um, and with over 37 languages from around the world, um, the Ambassador Series seemed to be like a very good idea to celebrate the wonderful heritage we have in our languages and cultures areas. Um, our first guest was Sir David Warren, former ambassador to Japan, um, who kicked off the series. And he was followed by Dame Rosalind Mayhew, who had been ambassador to Afghanistan and Sudan. Um, obviously, I think you'll understand, we've had a bit of a hiatus for the last year. Um, things have been going on. Um, we have moved enormous amounts of the college online. A lot of you who are language students and humanities students will hopefully have been benefiting that. And, and whilst there have been lots of challenges, what the wonderful thing about um, online has been enabling to reach even more people as City Lit and not just be limited to London and surround. Um, we did take a hiatus on the Ambassadors series initially, but again, it's an ill wind that blows some good is the fact that we, we are very excited today because it's not just in, in, in having another ambassador join us. It's actually an ambassador live, a live ambassador who's a current ambassador, but also from her country. And so for us, that's a, a great um, innovation for us. And a, it gives us a, a positive out of a difficult time. It also the fact that there's um, well over 150 of you, which is great because in our college, the um, theater only holds 100 people. So it means that we're extending way beyond our usual audience. So thank you for joining us. Um, as I said, we use this session, this the next 55 minutes, to celebrate international culture, international language, and really highlight um, as somebody who has done great service to our for our country, going to foreign lands and and representing us. And I have to say, I am truly delighted, as well as having um, Sir David and Dame Rosalind in the audience today. Um, I'm delighted to have Melinda Simons. Um, joining us, who is the current ambassador to the Ukraine and live from Kiev. So welcome, Melinda. And um, Melinda has a, a very illustrious and, and what we're learning as we do the ambassador series is there's no just one route to being an ambassador. And um, people have, have different specialities, people have different backgrounds, and they come together as, as their, those skills come together to their particular assignment. Um, Melinda has a, a, a incredible international background in multiple areas but prior to being ambassador had spent over 20 years in the much lamented department for international development which is now part of the foreign and commonwealth office and did some amazing work all around the world on behalf of our country and and developing those relationships so she has a huge amount of international experience on behalf of the uk and um, it gives us an opportunity to hear that, but also very much understanding the country she's in at the moment, which has been um, through an incredibly difficult um, few decades. And Melinda will talk not only about her career, but also about the, the situation in the Ukraine and, and the wider area. Um, for those of you who might need assistance, we have closed captionings um, at the bottom. So if you roll to the bottom of your screen and press closed captions, you, the wonderful Julie is supporting us on closed captions. Um, because of there are so many people and because of the nature of Zoom, um, I'm afraid people can't ask individual questions um, directly because trying to mute and unmute such a large audience is to be hard. So what we're going to ask you to do is um, not raise hands or, or try and do that. But if you could click on the chat box, sorry, not the chat box, please, not the chat box, the Q&A box. And in the Q&A box, if you have questions for Melinda, I will ask, uh, I will ask them on your behalf as moderator. Um, one request, because I want to keep the conversation flowing, is that please kind of make the, com uh, 
the questions as short as possible, because it's very hard if it's a long statement to then get to the end of the question, and particularly as a number of you will be doing it and they'll scroll in real time. So that's a bit of housekeeping. Um, Q&A box, if you've got anything, please look there if you need closed captioning. The way we're gonna do this, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Melinda now. She's gonna talk about her role, etc., and then come back and I will be asking her my questions and also questions on your behalf. And um, without further ado, Melinda, delighted to have you here virtually. Um, welcome to City Lit and um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mark. And um, I can't see any of you, but uh, I can see how many of you there are. And um, it's, uh, it's really great. And thank you for taking up the time uh, in this, uh, your lunch hour, if you're in the UK, middle of the afternoon, if you're in Kiev, um, to, to join. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to be part of this. Um, thank you for the introduction. I was going to try not to talk for too long, um, because I think the real interest of, of this kind of encounter is to be able to talk back and forth uh, about what's on your mind about uh, either what I say about my career, but also about what's happening in Ukraine. So I'll say a few words about both and then, uh, and then hopefully we'll be able to pull out more of it in discussion. Um, I also want to start with an apology because I think you know that this event was uh, supposed to be last week and had to be moved. And if you follow social media, then you'll know that the reason why it had to be moved is because at very short notice, um, I traveled to the east of the country with the president and along with um, some of the other uh, ambassadors from countries that have been giving a lot of support to Ukraine in the conflict and that was an extraordinary experience. It was my fifth trip to the east of the country and each one of them has been different and each one of them gives me an insight to the conflict. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But first of all, um, I want to talk for about three or four minutes about how I got here, how I got to Ukraine, because uh, as Mark said, it's my first ambassador job. I'm not a career diplomat. I wasn't kind of born and raised in uh, the Foreign Office and FCDO. Um, when I took up this job as ambassador, I hadn't been a head of political team. I'd never organized a Queen's birthday party. I hadn't run a trade mission. I hadn't done those core diplomatic jobs. What I had done was I'd started my career in business using my languages degree. I was a graduate of French and German to set up um, some operations for the company I was working for in French and German speaking countries and then from there to Eastern European countries. And then I quit that and went to work for an NGO that um, specialized in conflict res resolution and prevention in some of the world's uh, most poor countries where there was intractable conflict and learned a huge amount working for them. Uh, and then moved from there via studying for a master's degree at night, which was um, in which I specialized in East European um, politics and EU politics. Uh, and my master's thesis was on the war in Chechnya. Um, I moved from there to uh, apply to the civil service and I joined the Department for International Development. I was actually at DFID for about, I think it was between 10 and 12 years, uh, and did a really interesting range of jobs that included multilateral jobs. I was head of their European Union department, dealing in massive amounts of money that was being moved um, to the European neighborhood and to the African Caribbean uh, and uh, countries for um, overseas development and for conflict um, prevention work. Um, but I also served overseas for DFID. I was head of their Southern Africa operation and I lived in Pretoria for three years, focusing on um, economic growth and development and regional integration and migration. Uh, and uh, I was head of their Middle East department um, uh, actually during the beginning of this Yemen conflict and um, also with a very difficult brief in the occupied Palestinian territories during uh, an incursion in Gaza. So it was incredibly busy. But what happened in all that time is that um, right from the beginning, really, I was picking up and deepening my experience of working in conflict affected countries and fragile states. And that was my main area of interest and has been all through my career. So I moved from DFID to work for the Foreign Office, but I only actually did one Foreign Office job, which was, no surprises, head of their conflict department. And that included their peacekeeping team. So I was head of the peacekeeping team at the time when uh, the uh, Russian-backed separatists um, began this conflict in the east of Ukraine and talk of a peacekeeping operation began. And that um, discussion came, of course, to my team to talk about what that might look like. And as you'll know, if you're a Ukraine follower, uh, that didn't amount to a peacekeeping mission, but an OSC mission, which now operates in, in the east of the country. But I was following that because it was my brief within the Foreign Office. Uh, and that was my first introduction to thinking about Ukraine. I left uh, that, 
that job and I left the Foreign Office to go and work for the National Security Secretariat in the Cabinet Office to build the Conflict Stability and Security Fund, um, which is a cross-government fund which um, supports departments across government to work together to try to resolve violent conflict in fragile and conflict-affected countries around the world. And Ukraine was one of the top 10 countries in, in that fund and remains one of its priority countries. So uh, through that, um, I got a real first-hand look at uh, what the issues were in Ukraine and how a country like the UK was um, trying to use its different ranges of resource to help. So that was more or less where I became interested when I was thinking about maybe it could be this, this would be a good move from doing cross-government jobs and resource-based jobs and policy jobs to go and do something operational overseas. Ukraine became quite a, uh, it became an area of focus for me for at least two or three years before I thought I might like to try and, uh, and go for it. But I had an added dimension, which is that um, my whole family comes from Eastern Europe, my father's family from Poland, my mother's family on one side from Ukraine, um, from Kharkiv, in fact. And so um, actually, there's been that thread all the way through of an interest in Eastern Europe, because that's where my roots from a couple of generations ago, that's where they're from. So and often you'll find that in the Foreign Office, actually, that when um, people apply for overseas jobs, they will sometimes have a personal connection. That means there's just a heightened interest. Uh, about what happens there and a sort of slightly more personal engagement as a result of it. Although in my case, it was largely through food. And not that I knew that I, I had grown up eating a lot of Ukrainian food, but by the time I arrived in Ukraine and three months after, I began to keep recognizing food that was signed up, uh, served up to me as, as things that I'd uh, eaten growing up in, in my childhood and thought of as just family food. And in fact, is claimed here as um, classic Ukrainian food. Um, so, uh, so sometimes those connections are, are cultural and not necessarily political. So um, I uh, applied and I got this job and it was fantastic. And I spent the most difficult eight months of my entire career learning Ukrainian uh, as much as I possibly could, which was a 24 seven um, activity. And I say this as a language graduate, how hard it was um, to learn a Slavic language in such a short space of time and take exams, which the foreign office requires you to do. Um, and then came out here and, uh, and started using my Ukrainian from, from day one. Uh, and you start at speed because in a country like Ukraine, which is a country that the UK has a very close relationship with, there was a poll, um, I think, at the end of December that uh, rated the UK as one of the top five closest relationships with Ukraine. I think it came in at number three. Um, that makes for a very busy ambassador's job because then you have work to do uh, across the political and across the security and conflict space where the UK has been giving a lot of support to Ukraine. Um, military support as well as peacekeeping, peace building rather, and humanitarian support over the last six, seven years. But as you'll also know, as a result of leaving the EU, um, we struck a bilateral trade deal. And in, interestingly, Ukraine was one of the earliest trade deals to be signed with the UK and President Zelensky visited um, London in October and that deal was signed alongside the um, military enhancement deal and uh, an export finance deal. So it was an extraordinary expression of a next stage of a bilateral relationship that covered every area of cooperation um, that has meant that this job has got increasingly busier. Um, in addition to that, for more excitement, uh, the UK has the G7 presidency this year. And in Ukraine, a group exists called the G7 Ambassadors Reform Group. And the ambassador that represents the G7 presidency chairs that group. And so I took over the chairing of that group from the US in January. And uh, that group does an enormous amount of work supporting the efforts of the Ukrainian government to build the state, really, and address the reforms that are needed, that Ukraine has decided it needs to pursue in order to build that strong democratic state. Um, and a lot of meetings and discussions go on as part of that G7 uh, group. So I've been doing it now, of course, since the 1st of January, and I reflected to the group last week that it was really feeling like a second job. Um, because there was so much uh, activity and there were so many people who wanted to meet with the G7 group and talk about the work that they were they were doing. So that makes it busy. But I guess the, the, the biggest, if you like, excitement and challenge of all is that I arrived in September 2019, which was the same month that President Zelensky, who had just been uh, elected president a few months earlier, that was the month in which he built his first government, formed his first government. And so I had this huge privileged opportunity of being there just at the time when a very unexpected candidate, a person who had no formal political background himself, uh, had become president of this country that had all these challenges uh, and all the extraordinary opportunity of a population determined to shape its own destiny, a country full of young entrepreneurial people with fantastic 
thick tech skills and access to social media and a desire to travel, a constitution that made really clear that Ukraine uh, was pursuing European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations, uh, a vision to join the EU, a vision to join NATO, um, a really strong, increasingly strong European path and a desire to take its place uh, among um, European countries with global values. And so I was there at the beginning of that. And these last 18 months really have been a bit of a, a kind of roller coaster of um, moving to support uh, the government's efforts to do exactly that, to keep the reforms on track that had made huge strides under the previous administration, but not far enough to take them further on. And then to try to see if there were innovative ways to um, take forward the peace process um, to try to resolve the conflict in the East, uh, which would be a challenge for anybody, it was a challenge for Zelensky's predecessor, it's a challenge for him now, and therefore a challenge for me and for other uh, ally countries to look all the time to see how we might be able um, to um, support the direction of, of travel. So uh, that keeps me all incredibly busy. It's very exciting. It's quite unpredictable. It's incredibly tough. I just want to spend a couple of times on the toughness, uh, and then I think I'll stop. Uh, and um, uh, make it possible for you to put your questions. I think the first thing that's tough is that when I talk about the fact that Ukraine is fighting a conflict, people think about weapons, conventional weapons. And you'd be right if you are, of course, in uh, the east of the country, um, weapons are being used and soldiers are fighting each other and there's a front line and there are battalions and people are dying. Um, there has been a ceasefire in operation in, in Ukraine for the last nearly seven months. It's the longest ceasefire since the beginning of the conflict seven years ago. And that's fantastic, but actually the ceasefire is under pressure and Ukraine is losing, um, uh, losing some of their troops to snipers and to, uh, and to attacks. And so I traveled east last week in order to look at the pressures that the ceasefire was coming under. And I had the opportunity to see um, some of the ways in which that ceasefire was being put under pressure. And it's pretty distressing. But Ukraine isn't only under attack via weaponry and fighting. It's also under attack via disinformation and fake news. And I, I use that term literally, it's literally fake news in a way that I don't think, I'm not sure too many other countries have experienced. In fact, I, I think that Ukraine in many ways is, is the Petri dish in particular uh, in terms of Russian backed disinformation that make it such a potent weapon that I personally would put it uh, on a level with uh, military aggression because it's all pervasive through social media and through conventional media and in some parts of the country is a consistent, persistent, in fact, relentless uh, torrent of um, remaking of facts in order to um, produce a narrative that effectively is there to undermine the state. And anyone that I speak to when I travel around, and even in spite of the pandemic, which has made it more difficult, and in fact, of course, for long periods, impossible to travel, I've nonetheless been able to travel a bit. And I've been to Kharkiv in the east, and I've been to Kherson and Odessa in the south, I've been to Lviv and I'm shortly to go, I hope, a bit further to Zakopatia in the West. Uh, I've traveled in the environs of Kiev. And as I said, I've been to the East five times. And I ask people what they think are the biggest threats to Ukraine. And disinformation always appears uh, as one of people's top three threats to Ukraine. And it doesn't matter whether they are um, employees, you know, house, housewives, military, government officials, business people. Disinformation is one of their biggest worries. Um, and of course, they're also um, threatened via energy dominance by Russia, by Russia and that too uh, can be used as a weapon. And so you've got a kind of multiple um, approach to having to deal with a conflict, on top of which, of course, this is conflict between countries. Um, and quite a lot of the experience that the UK has grown in managing and thinking about innovative solutions to um, preventing or ending a conflict is grown with the, with the knowledge of internal conflict. So where ethnic groups start fighting each other or a government in an ethnic group starts fighting each other. And so the dynamics of that are completely different. In this case, the largest country in Europe is threatening the second largest country in Europe. And the dynamics of that mean that we have as much to learn um, by being here in Ukraine and helping and working alongside them as we do actually in terms of the assistance that, that we give them. So that's part of the, the, the challenge, and that, that is enough of a challenge to describe. But I think the other bit is the challenge in building the state. And a huge part of me, I have just massive admiration for all those in government and also in, in civil society and those in parliament and elsewhere who have such steely determination to get Ukraine to where they want it to be, to be a strong democratic country. And I'd have an admiration 
in any way, but this is a country where that is so contested, where efforts to strengthen institutions uh, can be so easily undermined by a decades old vested interest that uh, is incredibly well organized and experienced and will, uh, no matter what the move is, whether it's a statement about how things need to be or whether it's a draft of legislation uh, or a sort of presidential decree or actually a move by civil society to create a, uh, an initiative that would produce more transparency or produce more accountability, it's quite extraordinary how relentless um, the uh, opposition to that from those who would like things not to function quite that transparently, thank you very much, can be. Um, and that pervades pretty much every part of life. And because it's been around for so long, it's, it's a root and branch thing. It means that the government certainly needs to and knows it needs to and wants to tackle corruption and build a strong state and build institutions capable uh, of managing that. But it isn't just the government, actually. This, this is something that involves everyone. Um, it involves the courts and it involves businesses' behaviour and it involves the civil society engagement and it involves people themselves thinking about standards of life as well as standards of public life that they want to adhere to. So we are one of those countries that gives support for tackling corruption. And uh, you have to stand back and look at places, at parts of it where you think you can see uh, a way for the UK to be able to work alongside Ukraine and think about it in terms of steps. Because if you look at all of it, um, it can be overwhelming. But those challenges aside, I think the things that, uh, and I'll just stop here, the things that um, keep me going uh, are a combination of how utterly beautiful this country is, uh, how uh, amazing it is, a privilege to be living in Kiev, a very vibrant and very beautiful cafe society city with so much going for it that I'm absolutely certain the majority of my British compatriots have no idea about and part of me would really like more Brits to come and travel here and see it and part of me kind of doesn't because then it would be nice and quiet and you know it would continue to be the great undiscovered part of Europe but actually it deserves to be better known um, and uh, the engagement of people and the consistent interest in regional and local politics that pe people um, randomly who I talk to when I travel will uh, will display as something that's really quite extraordinary and makes me feel very positive um, that in spite of the biggest challenges, if people want this to happen, um, then they can make it happen. These things make it um, make me feel when I get up and think about the day's business like change can happen. So I'll stop there if that's all right, Mark, and um, leave it open to questions and comments. Brilliant. And we've already got a very good stream of questions. I want to, to kind of take a step back and regard just to talk about you a little bit in terms of, you know, it's fascinating that you're a linguist but you are thrown into this kind of deep immersion around a, a completely new language for you. And um, I think that's, I mean, a lot of us would never realize that um, there's that investment at the Foreign Commonwealth Office to make sure ambassadors aren't just going around shouting at people in English. Um, so what was your, you, you talked about it was, it was a challenge, but I mean, how, what is that immersion like? How, mm. how is it actually done? So I should say that this isn't um, something that all ambassadors in Ukraine have, and therefore it is one of the most powerful tools that I have that I can speak Ukrainian, and at this stage I can speak it pretty well and I understand it even better. Um, but the pre previous foreign minister uh, very cannily uh, organised breakfast briefings, foreign policy briefings, to which he invited ambassadors, and they were only in Ukrainian, and it was a very clever move. Uh, because um, for those who didn't speak Ukrainian, they were missing out, of course, on this briefing. But I turned up very gamely in my first month with my sort of fairly pathetic Ukrainian that had hardly been tested. Uh, and I was one of only eight people in the room. And I'm pretty sure that there aren't more than about 10 or 12 of all the ambassadors here who have decent enough Ukrainian. Many have Russian, so many more have Russian. But Ukrainian is the national uh, language, although everybody here speaks Russian. Government business is conducted in Ukrainian. So it's impossible to work here, really, without it can work, but um, you don't get anything like the access to, uh, to the information that you need without considerable help interpreting, translating all the time, which is burdensome. So it's a huge thing to be able to have it. But learning it, the reason why it was difficult, and of course this was stressful for me because, you know, I did well in my degree and um, thought of myself as a language, uh, as a linguist. And actually before learning Ukrainian, I'd um, learned a few other languages via different means. I'd done some online language learning, I picked up some Spanish, I don't know, there were a couple of other things where I'd been doing jobs and thought a bit of this language will help. And that had come very, fairly easily. When you, uh, and this is different, by the way, now, because partly because of COVID, but when I started my language training, 
it's full time and full on. You uh, turn up to the Language Centre, which is a bespoke um, facility inside the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. You're assigned a tutor. It's one on one in Ukrainian just because there are so few people learning Ukrainian. For other languages, it can be bigger groups, but for Ukrainian, it's one on one. And you study together for um, three hours a day, and then you're given at least three hours homework a day. And then at three month intervals, you take exams and you're required to get to a certain level. Um, and uh, in, uh, in my case, I had to get to operational level. And although I'd learned all these other languages, none of them were Slavic. So I think if I'd had any other Slavic language, like if I'd come to this with Russian, Bosnian, Serbian, Czech, any of them would have given me a bit of a way into Ukrainian. But because all the other language I, languages I learned were either Middle Eastern or they were West European, they were basically almost zero help. And that's why this was so hard. Um, I could read Cyrillic, but not brilliantly, but I had to learn that very, very quickly and then go from there to uh, understand the way in which Ukrainian is structured. So that's not something, as any good linguist will tell you, that you should be rushing. You should be able to go over and repetition of your grammar and get your foundations clear before you go on to fluency and the pressure of having eight months to, to get from zero to 60, as it were. Um, means that that was an incredibly intense period. And I do remember um, in my third, so I took my first exam after three months and I, I didn't do brilliantly, I did okay. But honestly, I was delighted. I think my first grades were like in the 50s, 55, 60. And I got a message here, I'm just being very frank with you all. I got a message from the language center, I think that said, gosh, um, you know, you won't be too pleased with that. You know, there'll be things to do. And I read that and thought, really? I I'm ecstatic. <laughs> Three months half killed myself and I have actually managed to sit and examine this language. It's brilliant. But of course, by the time I went on to the next one, because it was so intense, my sort of 55, 60 grades became, you know, 75, 80. Um, and I completed the C1, the operational exam. I passed it. Uh, I'm now kind of thinking about the extensive exam. Uh, so the other thing is I'm still learning Ukrainian while I'm here. But of course, while I'm learning it, I'm using it. And uh, so the one reinforces the other, but it's just that period of, of having to do this so intensely. But the other thing I think peculiar to Ukrainian, there'll be other single country languages, but Ukrainian historically is a disputed language. But you know, people previously in under Soviet regimes have been imprisoned for it, killed for it, exiled for it. Uh, it has, you know, some activists have used poetry and other forms of culture to express themselves in Ukrainian. It's been seen as a nationalist thing to, to do that. So, and putting Ukrainian front and center of the independent country has been an important part of, of it declaring itself as an independent country. What does that mean? It means that the textbook resources for Ukrainian are pretty terrible. If you, if you walk into any, you know, I don't know, resource center and look for something in Ukrainian, generally speaking, the, the resources for them will be quite antiquated. Luckily, online resource for Ukraine is a lot better, but it did mean that often my teachers and I would be looking for the latest app or, um, finding some great YouTube video we could use because there wasn't a single uh, good and reliable textbook learning resource for Ukrainian that would take you from A to Z. And that too, I found quite stressful. Well, I can think we in your the next stages of your career, a tutor at City Lit in languages is obviously something you should consider because I think it's actually, it's lovely because we have over 10,000 people a year doing, as I said, 37 different languages. And um, the diligence I find with our students around doing it is great. But I have to say nothing compared with obviously the, the amazing intensity that you had. Thanks for that. That's actually, it's something that I think you don't, you just don't think about probably from um, the average person's point of view. And uh, it's good that we, we really do pride people's national, national heritage as opposed to just sending somebody over and saying, well, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll get English. There's all, the Anglo-American kind of approach to that to kind of diplomacy could be disastrous in terms of nationalism. We've had a lot of questions around the EU, the Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine's relationship with Russia, and of course, a little bit about the, 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 the situation with the US. So I'm going to kind of try and and, and apologies because there's been quite a lot of questions. I'm going to come amalgamate them. So first off, you've talked a lot about the the um, the EU and the other ambassadors, etc. Obviously, we're no longer in the EU. That's had a reorientation of the Foreign and Com Commonwealth Office. There's been a merger between the FCO and DFID. Lots gone on. Um, so it, in fact, actually, as you were kind of training up to go on the ambassador's role, it wasn't like you were in steady state. Um, 
What's the relationship now like on the ground with the other EU countries? Because obviously, as you say, Ukraine is very pro-Europe. Has, has that changed considerably in your, your experience? And also, are we viewed differently now we're not as much European as we might have been before? Thanks. So I think I want to start with that last um, comment of yours because I disagree with it quite profoundly. We're no less European than, than we were before. And I know it may have sounded like a soundbite to say we might have left the EU, but we've not left Europe. But when you're working, actively working in an East European country and one that aspires to be part of a European bloc, it's not really about who's in the bloc and who isn't, but about how you identify yourself as a European country. And one of the important things about U U Ukraine is that important and dominant, though the idea of EU membership is, absolutely is. I'm not, uh, I'm not diminishing that at all. It's also important to remember that two other European institutions have a strong uh, footprint in, uh, in Ukraine and Ukraine in those institutions. And one is the OSCE and the other is the Council of Europe. And the UK is a member of both of those institutions and is active in both of those institutions. And, uh, and the conflict in Ukraine plays itself out in both of those institutions in a pretty intensive way. Uh, and our policy on um, supporting Ukraine in those institutions hasn't changed a bit. Nor has our policy of supporting Ukraine to join the EU. The point about our own referendum was about, the, was about the UK determining its own destiny. It was not a comment on whether anybody else should be joining the EU or not, or indeed about the EU as an institution. It was about the fact that the majority of people who voted in that referendum wanted to determine the UK's future outside the EU, not inside it. Ukraine, the will of Ukraine is to be inside the EU, and we are a supporter of Ukraine. So if that's what they want, if that's what people have determined, then it is our job as an ally uh, partner of Ukraine to help them get there. It's not a mutually exclusive thing. And so uh, our programme which here, which is focused, as I said, on building the state, on helping to build a strong democratic state, that contributes towards that. And we'll continue to do that. So that doesn't change. Relationships with European countries haven't changed either. Um, I think the thing to, I guess, remember is that even before uh, when we were in the EU and when I was serving elsewhere, although not for the Foreign Office, but for DFID, you, you needed, of course, you worked inside the EU with their development programme or their political programme. You were part of their negotiations, but you also had your bilateral um, programme and your bilateral objectives. And so you would look in a very lateral way at partnerships among all those who were present in your country to see who it made most sense to work with on, on those objectives. And sometimes that would be European countries and sometimes it would be others. Countries like India and Turkey have a very strong footprint um, in, uh, in Ukraine. It's quite important I have relationships with countries like that. But I also remain close to European countries and the EU ambassador here to whom I talk regularly because we only just left the EU and our objectives dovetail really closely. The EU programme that, that is there to build, help build a strong, European, uh, country, uh, strong Ukrainian country is pretty much exactly the same. And our bilateral trade deal with Ukraine is modelled very closely on the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement because it's a very good agreement. So you may uh, be outside the institution, but you may nonetheless share um, common objectives and continue to work alongside them. I would say, frankly speaking, that probably the biggest difference between being inside the EU in Ukraine and being outside the EU in Ukraine is that I have to hear from others what, what's being discussed inside the EU and before I didn't. And that's pretty much the only difference. Right. You said earlier, to build on that point about we've got a very strong national brand in the Ukraine. There's, um, we are seen as a very good partner. How did that come about? Was that a, a very much a strategic choice? Is the historical relationships that are going to go back centuries? How, how are we in such a good place in this one particular country? So Ukraine celebrates its 30th anniversary of independence this year. It's a, it's a relatively young country still. And, and the UK was one of the first countries to recognise Ukraine's independence. We established a mission here. I think it was less than a year after um, independence was declared. And that programme of support began immediately. And then we're one of the first to begin our programme of military support for Ukraine when uh, Russian-backed forces entered the eastern country and Russia annexed Crimea um, and have been one of the strongest supporters of that ever since. And that support... Um, has been very public and very appreciated um, by Ukraine. There is also a huge uh, affection from Ukraine for the UK. It's partly what I was talking about earlier about institutions. I mean, I'm constantly amazed actually by people who talk to me about um, the Old Bailey and Big Ben and, and the Queen actually, the longevity of a monarch. It's the longevity of institutions that a young country that needs to build strong institutions 
tends to to think of as uh, for the UK that even through the kind of twists and turns of Brexit, our institutions were standing very firm, and that's something that uh, in Ukraine is is just seen with a lot of admiration. But also, there's a growing and has been all through these thirty years a growing desire to learn English because it's seen as a you know a language that helps you with your frankly to travel, but also potentially to work in other countries. So the British Council here has a has a fantastic program which of course went online with COVID and has continued, as you described with City Lit, has continued to um, uh, capitalise on so that more people can reach it online um, to learn English. British Council is associated with that. BBC is big here and I cannot begin to tell you how many British football supporters, British football team supporters there are in this country. And it is my one biggest failing here that I am not a football fan. It, it means that I miss out on some quite important strategic discussions here. But So we have quite a lot of iconic um, things here that uh, Ukrainians love and like to be a part of and um, aspire to or want to visit or uh, have accessible. That's great. You've already, you've already touched on a number of occasions, but I think we'll be going more depth about the, the situation around the Crimea. So what is, is the, I'll, I'll, this will be multifaceted, but what, what is uh, Britain's position on the annexation of the Crimea and what does that actually mean on a day-to-day -day basis for your for, for your role representing us? So the UK position on the illegal annexation of Crimea is that, that Crimea is part of Ukraine and we will never recognize it as part of Russia. It's really very unequivocal. Um, we're reaching a quite important milestone anniversary of that, uh, of that action and that annexation coming up um, and so you'll see quite a lot of public communications on it. Um, and what it means in practice is that, uh, so first of all, we talk about it, which is quite important. It's very easy for something that happens to become a norm. And so you continue to um, ensure that it continues to be understood and there's a coalition of support for uh, recognition that Crimea has been illegally annexed. And that uh, manifests itself through sanctions and UN Security Council debates, which obviously take place elsewhere. But in Kiev, through quite a lot of outreach that we do here with um, families of political prisoners, um, the taking of political prisoners, and by political, I mean, you know, it can range from people who like a Facebook post uh, in Crimea that talks about the is in Ukraine, uh, from um, persecution of some Crimean Tatar groups. We do, uh, we have run human rights um, violation support um, and uh, run some quite creative campaigns that help highlight what exactly is going on in, in Crimea. I said I did a lot of traveling and I went to the administrative borderline um, between Crimea and Kherson, and it is absolutely one of the most moving trips I've done in a long time and, and I've traveled a lot in, in my career but it's definitely one of the most moving uh, and that's because Crimea was a place that many Ukrainians would go to you know for a weekend break go there for their holidays it was a massive summer destination and the road that leads from Hassan the main road is just this main straight road that runs all the way through except now there's it's cut in half and there's a there's a border at, um, at two places that I went to see and what's extraordinary about one of them, one of the older ones, one of them has been modernized, but the other was older, is that there are uh, burnt out cars that are abandoned there from, um, from 2014 when the, uh, when the action happened. And um, so it feels like a place that's stuck in time. Um, a bit like the last time I think I felt like that was when I saw the Berlin Wall, actually. A sort of thing, an aberration, a thing that shouldn't be there was how it felt. And, so it's and when you talk to Crimean Tatars, it's impossible not to be moved by the effect of the separation. It just feels like something that shouldn't be. So we do quite a lot of uh, awareness raising. And as I say, in more, more formal um, political arena, we um, make sure to use the tools that we have as a P5 member, um, as a supporter of sanctions, to make sure that the cost of having illegally annexed Crimea remains high for Russia. And how do you find the, 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 the what on the ground is the situation in Eastern Ukraine outside the Crimea? Because obviously it's not just limited to the Crimea, the Russian intervention, it has gone far more into um, Ukrainian territory as a whole. So it is two, I mean, it's two separate things, yes, because Crimea has been, it's been illegally annexed into Russia. There was the illegal referendum, uh, Russia regards it as Russian, etc. Whereas the Donbass uh, has not been annexed, it's been, it's been incurred, there's an incursion into it, if you like, and, uh, and there's fighting going on across the, across the contact line. Um, and I hesitate to generalize about the Eastern country. Ukraine is a huge country and I've traveled to these five different places because you're talking about a really large expanse of, of space. The contact line is 450 odd kilometers long. 
Um, it's uh, you're talking about a big space. So I've been down south to Mariupol and east to Berdyansk, and uh, last week I went to Avdiivka, which was only 80 meters from the the contact line. And you you meet different communities talking about different things. So I have been to communities um, where uh, a lot of the Donbass is um, agricultural. It's a quite large expanse of agricultural land, and I've met farmers and talked to them about the experience of trying to farm where their fields are mined and uh, how some of their neighbours take a chance because they, you know, that's their only livelihood and they go in there and legs get blown off. And that, um, until not that long ago, and actually still occasionally, uh, is a part of their lives or some poor kid throws a ball into a field and runs after it. That's, uh, that's very much part of, has been part of their life in one part. It's also a, a huge industrial area where, of course, lots of jobs inevitably lost because some of those uh, enterprises can't work. And then it's been a uh, the Donbass is a place where some really prestigious universities uh, have been, and uh, some of them have moved. They've literally up their university, moved out of the building, found a temporary building in the government controlled area and reestablished themselves. And in the past, the Brits have given them some help to do that. Um, and I've spoken with students who are who are at those kind of temporarily moved universities and talk with them about um, how they see it. People who are, who are from Donetsk or Luhansk, talk with real um, and no longer live there so I haven't lived there for the last six or seven years talk quite emotionally um, but also just with an increasing weariness about this conflict I mean after seven years you won't find anyone who doesn't just want this thing to end and I do think that's what President Zelensky kind of picked up on in his manifesto and was running for president was he he was um, tapping into that desire to find some way to break this impasse uh, and uh, and enable that region to be peaceful so uh, that's one of the thing, the biggest things I hear. But I think what I was also struck by was that when that incursion happened, the number of regular citizens who just packed a bag and went east to fight or to support fighters, and therefore the number of veterans here is, is huge, of uh, volunteer veterans, um, and a lot of trauma associated with that experience, of course. Even if you're militarily trained, there would be trauma. But if you're not militarily trained, that creates a really big societal issue that you cannot ignore, that you need to be able to reintegrate um, people to um, help them really to kind of rebuild, rebuild life. And so we do quite a lot of support for that through the UN agencies who are here. So the experiences and the stories that you hear are quite diverse. But I, it, I would say if there's one unifying message, it's that, that people have had enough and they want to see an end to it. And how, how is Ukraine's relationship with the other former Soviet um, nations? Like particularly, I'm thinking of Georgia as one of the questions came up because the, the continuing Russian incursion into its neighbors is, is not just the Ukraine, it's, it's happening all over. Um, it, does that create a solidarity or is everybody kind of on their own a little bit? No, I think they do. And there are interesting relationships between Ukraine and, and uh, all their neighbours, actually. There's a whole Eastern European from, you know, Baltics down um, story about um, building your country after, uh, after Soviet uh, administration. That's been really interesting for me to find out um, from Baltic states, from Poland, from, you know, uh, from Georgia and so on. There is, of course, there is a special set of issues for Georgia uh, and Ukraine um, over Russian aggression. And they do share experience quite a lot, um, and uh, and we see that. But it's not. I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure there are people who would regard it as a solidarity thing. But I don't think Ukraine is overt about that. I think they do see this as a as a general thing. But they also see it not just for the region. We talk about, you know, we talk about Russia's role being, and it's true that it's primarily a, a, a concern. This sort of activity for countries that border Russia. But actually, given um, proxy wars and given disinformation and given state poisoning, state sponsored poisonings, this is an issue that transcends and goes beyond uh, Eastern Europe and creates kind of coalitions of that kind of solidarity well beyond this region. And how did you work closely with our ambassador to Russia? And I mean, is there a lot of coordination or, you know, are you obviously de dealing with similar but quite different issues? We, um, we talk often, just as I do with uh, uh, ambassadors in all the neighbouring countries. I speak to our ambassador in Warsaw and in um, Chisinau and uh, in uh, quite often, actually recently in Minsk, given the uh, uprisings in Belarus. We talk quite a lot and just share views really on how the common issues are seen in each of these countries. But actually, if you're working in Moscow, there will be a, in some ways a completely different kettle of fish. Because the thing about <clears throat> the UK's policy on Russia is that you distinguish between the Putin regime and Russian people. Russian people may, may not hear it that way, but it absolutely is the case. 
that the concerns and the policy that we have and the sanctions are levied uh, against specific individuals who promote that aggression. But historically, the relationship between UK and Russia culturally, for example, is incredibly warm. And so the embassy in Moscow has that job to balance this, to ensure that those, if you like, non-aggression uh, relationships can, can continue so that we, we understand that commonality can still be, can still be uh, found among people, while at the same time we have to hold Russia accountable um, for what they have agreed to do and aren't doing. That's right. You talked a number of times, mentioned President Zelensky. Now, for those um, people who don't know in the audience, tell, tell us a little bit about his unusual background it'd be prior to becoming president and then how he's adapted. So this is an interesting one because people call him a comedian and, and I don't actually, I call him a businessman because, um, so he had a, a, a comedy show called Slucha Narodu, which means servant of the people. And uh, it's a wildly popular um, kind of comedy soap opera watched as much in Russia as in Ukraine, it's in Russian in fact, about a teacher who can't stand the corruption in his country and decides to run for president and then becomes president. And then like what happens next, that's basically the story. And so essentially life imitated art and he decided that he would run for president because he couldn't stand the corruption in Ukraine any longer. So he ran for president and then he won. And, uh, and so of course people talk an awful lot about his life playing itself out uh, in the context of, uh, of his show. But what you have to remember is that the production company, um, Quartel Devianos of Piat, which is the uh, name of his production um, company, he owned that company, he built it. He's a successful businessman in the entertainment sector um, and uh, knew what he was doing. So um, I am a bit more nuanced uh, about the idea that someone with absolutely no you know, relevant experience has come into this extraordinary job. I do actually think it is extraordinary that uh, anyone would want such a huge and such a pressurised job and anything that drives that um, is, uh, is an extraordinary thing. Though, of course, he's not the only one that's, uh, that's done this, including in this region, someone who's had little experience, chanced their arm, got in there on, on a wave of people desiring something very different. But he does know how to um, build his teams and uh, he's results focused quite a lot. And I think that nonetheless, of course, it will have been a tough learning curve um, for him and his entire team having got very clear what it is they wanted to do, build a strong economy, tackle corruption and end the war, which all sounds very simple when you say it like that. But of course, each one of those is a massive work of several years uh, and incredibly complex. And I think the learning curve for them has been how you work with and surf and bring on board the, all the different institutions and how you counter those vested interests to get there. And in some areas, you know, they've made the most fantastic progress and in some other areas. I think it's been really heavy going. And maybe to a degree, uh, that learning curve may have been part of it. But I do not doubt his or his team's intentions on all of those three objectives. So just, uh, it's interesting, you've mentioned fake news and you've mentioned disinformation. And obviously that's a particular problem in Ukraine, but becoming a problem sort of globally. Ukraine ended up playing a, a, a very interesting part in, in last year's presidential elections. First in terms of... Um, the impeachment trial about the pressure President Trump tried to present, uh, put on the Ukrainian president, but then also with the um, Joe Biden's son's association with the Ukraine. Has that kind of created tensions around the US relationship? Has it put Ukraine in a, how the hell are we involved in this horrible kind of political battle in the US? What, how's that played out on the, on the, in Ukraine itself? So uh, I will honestly say that inside Ukraine, not much in the sense of was it a destabilizing force here? No, it wasn't. Uh, uh, Pr President Zelensky did an interview recently um, for, uh, for a US publication in which he talked about it after the inauguration. Uh, and he, I think he, he, I mean, he confessed to feeling quite frustrated about effectively being dragged into, into something that no country would, would want to be a part of. And uh, I can certainly understand that. And I think that um, as much as they were able to manage it, um, you know, they kind of, they made a separation between what they were trying to do in Ukraine and stick to their objectives um, compared to objectives under the last, uh, under the last regime. In, in the whole time I've been here, um, the US hasn't had an ambassador in Ukraine. They've had a charge, uh, and the charge here has been fantastic. And there was an acting ambassador, um, Bill Taylor, who was here before um, the charge, and they've all been fantastic. Um, but inevitably, if you don't have an ambassador here, what is more, more difficult is to progress a, a policy. Um, in the case of the US, 
there's such strong bipartisan support for Ukraine that all the programs were still continuing. And these are significant programs, I mean, not least for the size. Um, they outstrip what, uh, what the UK offers. And in fact, again, there's a lot of commonality there. And we do work uh, quite closely with the US as another partner that we have a good relationship with. But what you can't do is kind of progress your policy alongside you know, Ukraine's evolving needs. And I think that's what the, the new administration is, uh, is uh, going to want to focus on. But of course, since, we, since their ambassador has not yet been named, and their policy not yet published, it's still early days, um, we'll have to wait and see. But my sense is that that uh, initial um, difficulty that Ukraine found itself in has not, and I very much doubt will be, a source of tension in building that relationship with the new regime. More likely, um, what they've their track record on tackling corruption and building strong states will be a real focus for people in the Biden regime who, as we know, come with really strong background in this region, and more than one of them know Ukraine very, very well indeed. Great. A couple of actually kind of interesting ones is um, offhand. What 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 are the big exports from the UK to the Ukraine? What do we send? You're talking about the trade agreement. And, and what are the Ukrainian things that kind of come back over to the UK? So Ukraine is quite big for the UK in uh, IT business services uh, and uh, in some agricultural produce. Uh, and those tend to be the two biggest, but there's also a little bit in um, transport and transport machinery, and actually the same the other way. There's quite a balance between uh, exports out of Ukraine to the UK and imports um, from UK to Ukraine. And uh, from uh, UK to Ukraine, it's, it is actually kind of industrial machinery a lot and um, know-how and expertise uh, in uh, clean agriculture, for example. And, um, but the scope to grow that is enormous. And in fact, one of the funny things that I keep finding when I travel is that there are micro initiatives that I keep tripping up over um, where um, British businessmen are, are trying a new, there's sort of, there's a car component that's being made here. For example, cars is one of our biggest exports from the UK, for imports rather than UK exports from the UK import to Ukraine. Um, but sometimes you'll find that some of the parts for those cars have been made here in, in some parts of Ukraine. So when we um, signed the trade agreement, one of the things that we were thinking was that some of those kind of micro areas provided potentially really good uh, openings to, to grow. And I do think that Ukraine has the potential um, to be uh, really big on growth in two areas. And one, one really is agriculture. This country is huge, literally geographically huge, with fertile soil. And given the um, size of the, for example, organic um, farming mar uh, market for organic food in the UK, some adjustments here in Ukraine could be a real, um, could be really dominant um, in that sector. But the other is, this is such an IT savvy um, country that has already made quite a lot of uh, inroads um, in providing IT business services and could develop itself as a regional hub um, over coming years. Part of our trade deal, we also appointed a trade envoy, Baroness Mayer, who is, who is really looking forward to traveling, but can't at the moment, obviously because of COVID, but has already started building those relationships between businesses um, in those sectors. So it's something we're all looking forward to being able to grow a bit more once we are a bit further through this pandemic. Last couple of questions. Um, the art scene in um, the Ukraine, is there, a, can you just give us a brief taste of it? Obviously lockdown does not mean that you've been able to go out to the things, but what, what should people be looking for? Tell us a little bit of taste of that. So that is deeply subjective, isn't it really? <laughs> but um, the, uh, the, the, the things that I've most loved is, so when I came here, people told me all about opera and it's true, opera is very big here and very beautiful and very accessible. Um, but uh, my personal love here is modern Ukrainian film. I think it's completely fantastic and so is modern Ukrainian music. In fact, it's worth, if anyone has got a couple of minutes, uh, looking at the Eurovision, Eurovision entry from Ukraine for, for this year because it's the most brilliant techno music entry. It's completely brilliant. And uh, they do a lot of experimental music here and I absolutely love um, accessing it. So uh, uh, media in that way, um, music and cinema, I think are massive, massive talent and growth areas here. Um, but also there's, a, there's an area of exploitation potentially to be had in um, traditional crafts, which have been quite niche in the UK, but which are beginning to explode now um, as, uh, uh, as industries. And, and it's creative in the sense that they're heritage arts. Um, and so something that I can see as a real growth. But otherwise, tech music, techno music and modern film, it's really innovative stuff. Well, getting the Eurovision Song Contest mentioned on, a, on a, a, an August stage by you is, uh, is fabulous. Um, one last question, which actually is, again, a more personal. We've got um, 
a student of languages at university and she's saying I'm, I, she's obviously inspired by you and it's the how how would I obviously there's no obvious path but what would I do to kind of take go from being a language student into the diplomatic corps is there a, a, a things that she should be doing so uh Again, this is a bit subjective, but I think it's probably worth saying that when I graduated from university, I graduated in an economic slump. So that's gonna sound really familiar to people who are graduating now, um, because I had quite illustrious ideas that because I spoke languages, you know, people would want me because I spoke languages. But of course, when you tra start traveling around continental Europe, you find everybody speaks those languages. They've grown up speaking those flipping languages. It's, it's what you can do with those languages. And um, because I graduated in the slump, the kind of jobs I might have wanted to do, there were just not enough of them. So I zig zigzagged my way through to where I wanted to be by taking um, initially sales and marketing jobs in the private sector and there cutting my teeth on business, first domestic business, and then using my language as an international business. And then, hey, presto, within four years, I was someone who spoke French and German and could do business in them. Uh, and so I think the answer for, for linguists, in other words, those that have a, a non-vocational kind of degree, is to identify opportunities as as soon as possible that will demonstrate what you can do with those languages not just that you can speak them and then that will provide your ladder to where you want to get to great advice thank you um, i'm now going to hand over to jane cooper who's a great friend of melinda's but also the deputy chair of city lit just to say a final few words um, the floor is yours jane thank you mark and thank you so much melinda um it's been fascinating and amazing and i've sort of noted down a huge number of things that I just wanted to note. But first of all, let me say a huge thanks on behalf of City Lit for joining us today and on behalf of the many, many people listening in from around the UK and in fact around the world. Um, it's been so, so interesting and we could talk for another hour, but I won't ask you to stay for another hour. Um, you know, it's such insight into your career uh, and that wonderful thread of sort of conflict and languages that, that runs through it. Um, I personally, and I'm sure others uh, agree, I'm delighted and reassured that we have somebody so experienced and dedicated and professional, uh, you know, rep not only representing the UK in uh, Ukraine, but tackling the difficult issues proactively. I mean, that, that reassures me hugely. And I'm now going to be a very a big fan of the FCDO as a result of that. Um, but mostly you've given us such insight into amazingly challenging issues that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, from Crimea to navigating Brexit, fake news, you know, strengthening institutions, all those things, um, you know, are huge issues in themselves and you, you, your proactivity on them and your knowledge and insight has been amazing. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, your world is so unlike our world working from home here certainly where I am in the UK. Um, but good luck going forward. Um, and thank you so much. If we were in the theatre, we'd all stand up and clap. Um, and I don't think we can do that because we're on Zoom. So I'm going to clap because you could, hopefully you can see me and hear me. <laughs> thank you. You've been amazing. Thank you, Jane. So thank you, Jane. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you to the many City Lit people who've joined us today. Uh, thank you for being part of our community and also studying with us. And um, Melinda, when you're back in the UK next, we'd love to host you in the college. And also, if you ever want to learn a different language, we're very good at doing that. So <laughs> delightful, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much, Melinda, and um, good luck with the rest of the assignment. Um, we really appreciate you spending the time today. Thank Cheers. you. Bye. -bye. Bye.